By the end of the First World War, the role of the fighter had been defined. Its task was to win control of the skies over the battlefield and to prevent the enemy from bombing, or strafing or spying. The most famous fighter of this war was the Sopwith Camel. Built of wood and wire and canvas, its biplane format gave it tremendous wing area for its size and that made it immensely manoeuvrable and well suited for close aerial combat. From this great aircraft, the Hurricane can claim direct lineage because Sopwith evolved into Hawker engineering. In the harsh economic environment that followed the First World War, the demand for military aircraft diminished. With more pressing peacetime requirements and a consequent slashing of military budgets, the RAF was cut back to a skeleton force. But civil aviation flourished. A whole series of records were set in the 1920s. Those achievements weren't lost on the Air Force planners. By the 1930s, large aircraft had the ability to cross national borders and bomb foreign cities. For the first time, civilians could be targeted. It was widely believed that there was no effective defence against a massed bomber force. Fighting fire with fire was deemed the only solution. So Britain's Air Ministry set aside most of the RAF's budget for the development of modern bombers. So fighter development was seriously neglected. The RAF soldiered on into the 1930s with a biplane fighter force reminiscent of the First World War. Hawkers, like most other aircraft manufacturers, were still designing biplanes. In 1924, Sidney Cam had been employed as their chief designer. One of his first projects was the Hawker Hart, a light bomber with a top speed of 184 miles an hour. And that was remarkable for the late 20s. It was faster than RAF fighters of the day. As a result, a fighter version was developed, the Hawker Demon. That entered service with the RAF in 1931. The Demon's successor, the Hawker Fury, broke the 200 miles an hour barrier and represented the pinnacle of Hawker's biplane designs. During these years, Cam gained a reputation for attractive designs. But despite some increases in speed, these latest fighters were already outmoded. In Germany, the Nazis were preparing for war. With tremendous resources allocated to aircraft research, Hitler's designers built modern, fast, monoplane bombers. It became vital for the RAF to have faster fighters. At Hawker's, Sidney Cam set about the design of a new aircraft. He was responding to an Air Ministry specification for an eight-gun fighter that could fly faster than 300 miles an hour. That was a full 100 miles an hour faster than the Fury. The new aircraft boasted a new Rolls-Royce engine, the Merlin. But for ease of production, it used the old jigs and tools developed for the Fury. It was constructed from metal tubes supported by wood and covered in fabric. That produced a light but strong aircraft which was rugged and easy to repair. A wide, retractable undercarriage gave it stability on bumpy airfields. On November the 6th, 1935, K5083, the Hurricane prototype, made its first flight from Brooklyn's airfield. Now fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin C engine producing 1,030 horsepower, the aircraft had a top speed of 315 miles an hour at 16,000 feet. After extensive trials at the Aeroplane and Armament Establishment at Martlesham Heath, the aircraft was approved for production. The first aircraft off the production line was delivered to the RAF in October 1937. The intervening 16 months had been used productively to fine-tune the basic design. It now boasted eight US-built Colt Browning machine guns, four in each wing. 
They were mounted just outside the arc of the propeller. That gave the aircraft accurate and concentrated firepower. Each gun was supplied with 300 rounds, allowing 14 seconds of continuous fire. With international tension increasing, the RAF finally had its first modern fighter, one which was a potential deterrent. On September the 1st, 1939, Nazi forces invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. The British Expeditionary Force was sent to France and with it went four squadrons of hurricanes. In May 1940, Germany invaded Holland, Belgium and France and by the middle of the month, the British and the French were fighting a rearguard action. France wanted more aircraft and four further hurricane squadrons were sent. But in Britain, the Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command, Sir Hugh Dowding, had strong reservations. He wanted to conserve his force for the inevitable battle for Britain. Churchill heeded his advice and no more frontline fighters were sent. This decision was to prove vital in the coming months. A few months before, the Hurricane had tasted its first blood. An aircraft from No. 1 Squadron had shot down a Dornier 17 on October 13, 1939. As the weeks passed, the Hurricanes notched up further kills, and it was clear that the aircraft was a potent force against the bombers. But the Hurricanes' first engagement against German fighters was less impressive. On December the 22nd, 1939, three Hurricanes were set upon by German fighters diving from above and behind. The lethal Messerschmitt 109 proved to be more than a match for the Hurricane. had two cannon as well as two machine guns. The 109 could fire from greater range and its explosive shells could penetrate armour plating. In addition, the ME 109 had a bigger engine. That gave it a higher top speed and a greater rate of climb. Between May the 28th and June the 4th, more than 330,000 British, French and Belgian troops were evacuated from the beaches at Dunkirk. The Hurricane squadrons were rapidly withdrawn, leaving behind valuable spares and tools. And so began the intense period of preparation before Hitler turned his ambitions to Britain. Losses in the French fighting had been heavy, with almost 200 Hurricanes destroyed. But those early aerial combats had taught fighter command some valuable lessons. Guns on the Hurricanes were reset at 250 yards range, rather than the previous 650, and that gave more concentrated and effective fire. The gun lubricating oil was thinned down with paraffin to stop it freezing at altitude. Moisture in the gun barrels was prevented by taping fabric over the gun ports. And the unofficial practice of fitting armour plate behind the pilot now became standard. Though the situation seemed grave with the German armies massing just across the channel, there were some definite advantages in Britain's favour. As an island nation, Britain had a natural barrier between her and the invasion forces. The second advantage was, however, man-made radar. Screens were monitored 24 hours each day and when echoes appeared the operator could measure the range, the height, bearing and numbers of enemy aircraft. This information was then passed to fighter command and eventually to operations rooms. Controllers could then vector fighters to intercept.
This network allowed the RAF to conserve its resources and pick its targets, rather than sending squadrons off on endless searches over southern England. Even at this late stage, continual improvements were being made to the Hurricanes. From March 1940, all new aircraft off the production line had metal wings and upgraded Merlin engines, contributing an all-round improved performance. The Hurricanes' partner in defence, the Spitfire, was all metal. It shared the same engine and armament, but the Spitfire's flying characteristics were completely different. It was more streamlined, faster and more manoeuvrable so the Spitfire was better suited to taking on the German fighters while the Hurricanes intercepted the bombers. From the middle of July, the Luftwaffe began attacks on Channel convoys. On the 20th, during a raid, Dover Harbour was also attacked. For the first time, RAF fighters were sent up in numbers. It was the first big dogfight of the battle. But Downing had to tread a fine line. He had to conserve his fighter strength, knowing that the main thrust was still to come, but he also had to do what he could to protect the shipping. At this time, Fighter Command only possessed 57 squadrons of fighters. 29 of them operated Hurricanes. Seventeen of these were part of eleven group which would bear the brunt of the fighting in the southeast. Once when I had almost run out of ammunition having shot down one 109 into the sea and then attacked the second one, hit him but wasn't able to finish him off and followed him down over the sea over Folkestone Harbour and was able to form mate on him as he was only doing about 200 miles an hour and finally in order to make sure he went down I slapped his uh, port tail plane off with the tip of my starboard wing and about three feet came off the wing tip of my starboard wing and flew into the air and we were down at about 200 feet and he went into the sea. On August the 12th, the Luftwaffe mounted its first major raid on radar stations and airfields. 36 German aircraft were shot down for the loss of 13 British machines. The following day was scheduled as Adlertag, or Eagle Day, the day that the Germans count as the beginning of the battle. Believing that six radar stations had been knocked out, a large force of German bombers attacked through bad weather. They expected to reach their targets undetected. day, 47 German aircraft failed to reach their bases for the loss of 13 British fighters. As it turned out, the massed synchronised raids of Eagle Day had been disrupted by the weather. A second attempt was made on the 15th. Five hundred and twenty bombers with twelve hundred and seventy escort fighters attacked in unison. They caused heavy damage to southern airfields and factories. But the damage was too scattered to have a major effect on fighter command's effectiveness. To make matters worse, the day scheduled to start the downfall of Britain turned into a German rut. To the Luftwaffe, it became known as Black Thursday. The losses on both sides were never to be exceeded in the battle. It became almost a routine. And dash out to your aircraft, and you could go from being fast asleep to being up in the air in under two minutes. As you were climbing up and doing your cockpit checks, the controller would give you over the radio the height you had to climb to, 
the distance to the enemy aircraft that were coming in, their altitude, and um, probably their compass direction as well. And with the aids of radar, uh, these interceptions were spot on every time. After you run out of ammunition, you would peel off and dive down to the nearest uh, fighter airfield. We knew them all very well. Then the ground crews would rearm the aircraft, refuel them, and this they could do in about 15, 20 minutes. And then you'd be off again. Over the following weeks, pilots on both sides displayed tremendous courage and skill. But by the autumn, the Germans had failed to gain air superiority. Without it, the invasion of Britain was postponed, as it turned out, indefinitely. The RAF had, by the narrowest of margins, contained the greatest air force the world had ever seen. 461 RAF pilots had been killed out of a total force of less than a thousand. 915 aircraft had been destroyed. But post-war figures revealed that the Germans had lost 1,733 aircraft. The Hurricane had proved itself in battle. Its rugged airframe could sustain far more damage than any other fighter. That, together with the fact that it was a very stable gun platform, made it the most successful fighter of the battle. It had been appreciated from an early date that the basic Hurricane had considerable development potential. With the introduction of the new Merlin 20 engine, this version became the Hurricane 2A. In early 1941, the Hurricane 2A SRS-2 was introduced. That had interchangeable wings. More armament was added, greatly improving the Hurricane's hitting power. The first variant, the 2B, had 12.303 machine guns and provision for two 250-pound or two 500-pound bombs underneath. The second variant was the 2C, which was armed with four hispano suiza 20mm cannon. The RAF had known full well that the cannon represented more hitting power than the machine gun, but development had been slow and it was beset with mechanical problems. Trials as early as 1939 showed a number of defects, and it was not until the summer of 1941 that these were ironed out. In total, 80 squadrons were eventually equipped with the cannon firing two Cs. As an armament fitter, I was responsible for, uh, for rearming all the aircraft on our flight. Uh, at the, the first aircraft we got were the eight 303 machine gun aircraft. So you had four 303 Browning machine guns in each wing. Uh, the next, after several operations up and down the desert, we, we were returned to base to re-equip with, with newer aircraft and we got the 12 gun Hurricane fighter. That had six machine guns at each wing. The bank of four here and two outboard on each wing. And then ultimately the Hurricane was, was developed, of course, because of its very deep cord wing, it could accept the 20 mm cannon very easily without putting the blisters on the top or underneath as you have to do with a Spitfire. So the Hurricane became a very good aircraft in that, on that score. When the Hurricane's planned life as a fighter had virtually come to an end in 1942, the introduction of yet another wing was to rejuvenate this remarkable aircraft. Known as the 2D, this mark was now armed with two 40mm anti-tank guns plus one harmonised machine gun for sighting. Target below. The Hurricane's P-51 
lead off and swoop down to the attack. blazing now, finished, knocked clean out of the wall by the tremendous power of fire from the tank buster's cannons. The job has been well done. And so the flight reforms and heads for home. For the little camp, which wherever it may be, is the center of the squadron's life. The success of the wing variations led to the final production version called the Hurricane 4. That had the powerful Merlin 24 or 27 engines. Here it's operating from a temporary strip in Calcutta. The new universal wing made the Mark IV a highly specialised ground attack aircraft. It was used to a particularly devastating effect against the Japanese in Burma. Hurricane's ultimate firepower was achieved by the installation of a weapon system first proposed in 1941 and tested on the Hurricane in February 1942. The Hurricane 4 became the first of all Allied aircraft to use rockets operationally. It led to newspaper headlines claiming that the little Hurricane packed a punch equivalent to the broadside from a destroyer. One of the main reasons for the longevity of the Hurricane was the problem-ridden development of its successor, the Hawker Typhoon. Typhoon was developed by Sydney Cam in 1937 and first flown in 1940, but it took three more years before it realised its full potential and started to take over from the Hurricane in the ground attack role. The Hurricane's operational life extended well beyond the end of the war, and it was not until January 1947 that the last squadron, number 6, relinquished its Hurricanes. With a total of 14,543 built, it was undoubtedly one of the great fighter aircraft of the Second World War. <laughs>